It's Kathy Van Ness. It's Friday night. I'm here with the executive chef Greg Fry Jr. And we're going to have a conversation about the most important worker on the planet today, and that is the honeybee. The, and the most underappreciated worker on the planet, and one we cannot live without, the honeybee. So, thank you so much, Greg. Hey, I'm Thanks. happy to. It's, I look forward to talking about bees. I know you do. So I'm just <laughs> going to start with a couple little, because I know you and your bees. By the way, Go just to it. sort of do another interface here, we have about 150,000. Oh well, now in the winter time, uh, we don't have money. But in yeah, in the in about <laughs> the season, we have about 150,000 bees. And we have our, we have little houses, and they have little golden door icons on them because they're golden door bees, of course. And they live out in our land. You don't see them, and we actually make our own honey. Mm -hmm. So. Most important is it believed that the honey history dates back as far as 10 to 20 million years ago. And the practice of beekeeping to produce honey, apiculture, am I saying that correctly, mm -hmm. dates back to at least 700 BC. Who did you learn this art from? You know, I learned this from, this is really one of those things that you pass down. There's a lot of knowledge that's been put into books. Um, there's amazing movies that are out there. Uh, but, you know, in the short time that I've been doing this, and I would never sell myself as an expert, I know a lot now, but I know very, very small amount compared to what really you yeah, need to know. Um, so I've been working with a mentor, but I actually been now, after three years, I'm working with mentors. And Bill Meyer was my first mentor, and he has been in this area in San Diego for 30 years, and he has raised... Uh, you know, at one point in time, he had several hundred, I mean, like 600 hives wow. that he was handling. And this is really himself. And uh, he's culled it down a little bit to more about 250 to 300. This, and it's very tough. Um, but, you know, I also work now with our honey provider here at the Golden Door. So we get our honey now from Rex and Pat Christensen. And Rex is one of the larger um, beekeepers here in San Diego, uh, migratory beekeepers. Well, you know, People are like afraid of bees. Yeah, uh, you know, they're it's normal. They're swatting them and they're trying to hit them. You're not afraid of these bees when you go work with them? I mean, Let's I put see it this you way. out I'm there. I'm afraid of a lot of bees without my equipment. You don't even wear, we have, <laughs> we have some wonderful equipment in the back. You don't mm -hmm. even wear the equipment. No, I mean, every, I've got know, the hat on and the vest. And I mean, I don't know if you saw, but early at the beginning of dinner, there happened to be one of the little girls that was stuck in the comb and, uh, oh, I saw and her, she, course. You know, so I was able to get a little honey, One put it on the my finger, girls and is a bee. yes, <laughs> and I, you know, she, she just, you know, I have to say, is they're they're similar to, I I feel it like they're similar to like dogs, and if you are calm and confident around them, they will be as well. That is not to say that all bees are like that. Every hive has its own temperament. Um, some are much more genteel than others, and. There are some who are appreciative of the care, but really honestly don't want to have it. <laughs> so I want to take that a little bit farther. You're going to a place where I love. You, I want you to describe to our guests the life of the hive. And I re from down to that little sliver of that story you know that I love, right. the little opening where you have the warriors. Mm -hmm. I really want you to describe what the queen does, what the male bee does, what the female bee does, and what happens in that world. And you know, the last time we talked about this, since then, it's amazing what you learn about, it. Um, you know, the hive. And so when I'm talking about bees tonight, I'm talking about the hive as the organism. Um, and that's something that I and many others do believe that it's not the individual bee as the organism, it's the hive. Similar to like you and I, we are made up of different bacterias, um, all sorts of different cells that all have to come together and work together to make what we do, you know, and live. And the same thing at that hive. Every bee in that hive, their only interest is in the benefit and you know the success of that hive. There is no personal wants, no personal desires. There is no bee, and this is a misconception that the queen rules the roost. The, the other bees, if they don't like the queen, they will take her out and send her on her way. So they get a new queen. They could. They so just, do they vote? You know, it, I, I mean, how I, do you get elected to be queen? I like to be a fly on the wall. Let's like, put it that how, way. How, 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 is there a, pro, is there a pro, <laughs> proxy like line up and say who's the cutest? No, it's like, you know one the of the biggest, one, of, one of the biggest reasons why a queen will not be will not survive is we we call them drone layers. She just oh. lays too many males. Real no. And yes, you know, you and that's a bad thing. And so when you have an and that's an unfertilized queen. So 
So you know, wait, to, wait, to, let's just wait, wait, let's go back to the no, beginning. No, how that. would they know that they do their accounting? Yeah, I mean, well, they, they know that, you know, nothing's getting done. Well, why is that? Well, there's a bunch of males in the hive. Well, this is, ladies, what you need to know. <laughs> what, does the male, so, what does the male do? So this is, this is the makeup of the hive. Oh, you gosh. have every hive has a queen. The queen is responsible for laying every bee that's in that hive. And that queen, at the, during, through the spring and summer, she has to lay 1,500 to 2,000 eggs a day. That's her body weight in eggs just to keep the hive moving along. Some queens lay more than others, some queens lay less. And when a queen lays an egg, well before, when, you know, when she emerges from the cells, she's a virgin. She will take a few days collecting her energy and then she goes on a mating flight. And this is where she will fly away from the hive, the only time, less than she's forming, the only time, most, most of it's the only time that she will leave that hive. She goes on a mating flight, she will mate with seven to 10 drones and that one flight, maybe a second flight if she didn't meet anybody. Um, and in that, in, that, in that time, she will collect all of the sperm that she will need for her entire lifetime. That's amazing. Which could be anywhere from four to seven years. Oh. She holds it in suspended animation, and then she has the ability to lay a fertilized egg, release a little sperm, fertilize the egg, which will become a worker bee, a female bee, or not, which will become a male bee. And the amazing thing about how they don't mix or co-mingle their DNA is that they have to fly out and away. So there are trees that are designated in the area as mating sites and the males all leave around the same time every day in the afternoon. They go and sit around this tree and they hang there and if they're lucky enough a queen will fly by, they will go, they will all fight and swarm around the queen and if they get to swarm, if they get to mate with her, they die. They die. So it's a now, wonderful life. Now what do they, they don't cook, they don't clean, <laughs> they just mate. So wait, so wait, let's go back. What do the male bees do versus the female bees? So the male bee, the male bee does, I mean, the male bee is there for one purpose and one purpose, one purpose only. That's to mate. I mean, that is well, what just What if they to, don't get to mate? If, well, then at the end, so in the fall, there are useless mouths to feed because they don't clean. They will feed themselves occasionally if they happen to find That's themselves nice. wandering next to the honey. But otherwise, they ask for handouts. And the other worker bees have to give them a little bit of honey. There's other bees in the hive that feed. There are bees in the hive that take out the dead bees. There are bees in the hive that clean the cells. There are bees in the hive and those aren't that the male take bees? care of the queens. Those are all the girls? This is all the women. Oh my gosh, and I think then we there's know this the, story. And like your favorite part, <laughs> there are bees who check to make sure everyone coming into I the hive. This. Yeah, yeah, I love this. Is, is that still the girl bees? Or that can be the still ma- work, still oh the girl bees. Gosh. All the work, so when you're out and you get stung, that's a for female bee. When you're out and you're looking at the flowers, it's a female bee. You rarely, if ever, see males. Sometime you're out in a walk, you look up and you see a bunch of bees just hovering in the air, steady next to a tree. Those are males. That's so, fa- you know, don't you think this is like, fa- did you know this? I'm not kidding, right? I'm telling you, I love Friday night speaker series. I get smarter all the time. I just had no idea. <laughs> I don't even swat them anymore. I go, go on your merry way. You're doing work. No problem. <laughs> Can bees recognize you? Can our bees, do they know you? I don't believe so. I really don't. They don't like I, I, a scent or something? You know, like he's the nice guy, he's not going to come in here and do anything nasty? I don't know. We don't have our co- uh, communication level up to that But can, uh, What, what about the yet. different hives? Does but, different hives react differently to you? Um, I'll have to say this way. The hives are very consistent in how they act. Um, and the nice thing about that is that I can usually tell if there's something pro- uh, an issue or a problem just by the way the hive is acting. They're very, very consistent in that. And so, no, I don't, I don't believe, and that could be when I'm with somebody else or with other people. I don't really believe that they necessarily recognize you or I as a caretaker. And I always say it's like, you know, we think, you know, the, the name is beekeeper or apiarist, but beekeeper, keeper is really kind of not a very correct term in the way I see it because I'm not keeping the bees. They're free to come and go as they please, and nor are they working for me. Uh, there, you know, I really feel more as if I am the um, provider. Right. If I see that they don't have water, I give them water. If I see that they're not getting enough food, I give them food. If I see that they, you know, aren't, you know, they're in danger with a disease, I may have some tools that I can utilize. But I have to say that the bees are much better at doing all this themselves. Yeah. And uh, what is 
now become what the beekeeper's responsibility and what I have taken on as the beekeeper's responsibility is to be the, the educator, to be the, the word, the mouth, you know, to say, you know, to say to everybody how important they really are, why are they important to us in our daily lives. They don't get to do that. They can't do that, you know, and, and I get the you get to do that. I get that, so you, you know, that pleasure. I think explain to our guests, how do you get bees? I mean, you had to go order them. Tell us about well, that Well, we have, you know, our best hive out there is, like is a hive that I collected out of a, a, a water irrigation box. You know, I, I rescued them. How, so how do you do that? You just walk so, up and go, let's go, I got a better house? You know, I put a bunch of honey in a box and I say, that box or this box? And they no. just follow you um, like pie pipe? So it? honestly, what I do is I have my little smoker and, you know, to, you know, this is really nice that somebody actually would take the time first off to call me yeah. and not just spray a can of Raid in there and just call it done. Um, you know, there everybody has a bee collector's list. Everybody has their town, their county has got beekeeping society, whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. And they know exactly who to call and some of these people will do it for free, some of them will charge you a little bit, but they're most always less than the exterminator, unless they gotta tear up half your house, mm -hmm. anyhow. But so like this, I go to this irrigation box, it's a box in the, in the ground, I pop open the lid, kind of take an assessment of it, and then the dirty work happens. You know, most of the time they are really angry that they're getting disturbed. Can you tell if they're the kind of bees that you actually want to rescue? Is I want to rescue them all. You want to rescue them. So there's, <laughs> so, not, uh, there's, there's not, not like bad bees, like you guys look like you're really uh, like... You know, there, yeah, there's more aggressive bees, and I think that when I do come upon that, that r I end up taking them to some other area, okay. some area that would be... Um, uh, you know, less of a nuisance to the local area. Right. Fortunately for us here, we have a lot of space. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I have not had to rescue a hive like that. But, you know, here in San Diego, we are in an Africanized area. And about 9% of our population, this was back in the last census, which was about four or five years ago, 9% of the population that they tested was Africanized. That's really not that much. Um, and most of those bees live in rocks in the ground, holes in the ground, um, Africanized bees tend to sometimes like soffits and eaves, um, but uh, those bees actually are very strong. Yeah. And, and what I mean by that is like all those things that we talk about now that are those diseases and the natural predators that are plaguing bees, those Africanized bees are actually very resistant to them. Um, and it's, I actually do like having the wild bees because many times, uh, often, they have a little of that trait in them. You know, remember, that queen mated with seven or ten drones. And that is how it's amazing that they don't end up mating with their own hives. So she doesn't mate with either her own siblings or her own, you know, uh, yeah, children. Yeah. So th this is a, uh, an ingenious way for this. But, you know, if they have a little bit of that trait, it makes them a little bit tough to work with. But the ones that are really aggressive are also aggressive at collecting nectar. And they're also aggressive at pollinating. The ones that are very docile and just, hey, whatever, they're not as good at collecting honey, and I have to do a lot more work with them. So a honey bee's wing, try to say that very quickly, stroke is incredibly fast, about 200 beats a second, yeah. which makes their famous distinctive buzz. And a honey bee can fly up to six miles and as fast as 15 miles an hour. So how far do our bees fly? Well, hopefully they just go 300 yards to our garden and back. Do, would, would they go farther? Would you think? <laughs> Absolutely. I know they do. I, I know they do because um, just, uh, for instance, there was a few weeks ago we were getting this really um, neon pink pollen. You know, from the hikers to the lands guys, uh, nobody saw any plant giving off that pollen. I don't know where they're getting it, but they were flying someplace else and getting it. I live about, as the, as the crow flies, about a mile and a half away. Um, I'm tempted to put dots on my bees and see if they're You're actually right. coming to my house. I, I really would. <laughs> You're following I, I, I'm, I'm almost positive. I mean, they are, you know. What, so one, what would that be that they're collecting? What is it? Oh, I mean, the pink you know, and everything. Flower? You know, okay, so good time for the, you know, the, the idea of stati statistics and in coming into this. So my favorite on this, especially with the wing beats, the miles per honey, gallon of honey yeah, this is a big for a bee is seven million. So one gallon of honey could propel a bee seven million miles. That's a lot of trips to the moon and back. That is really incredible. incredible. Uh, and very how many, efficient. How many bees animal. would it take to make a, 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 a jar? 
So one pound of honey, which you know, if when you go to the grocery store or the or the breakfast, you're going to get that 12 ounce jar. That's the little honey that bear, right? So you add another quarter to that. You have about pound of honey. One pound of honey is going to take one and a half to two million flowers. So that's for a pound of honey. Now a hive, just going into winter time, I need to leave my bees with 40 pounds of honey in there for them to survive winter time. That's normal. So do the short math. That's about 80 million flowers that they had to visit in order to survive the winter. That's not for the whole year. A good hive will produce anywhere from 90 to 150 pounds of honey throughout a year. Um, I will get to take some of that, hopefully. That's a lot of work, though. That's a lot of traveling. So one pound, one and a half to two million flowers, about twice the two, tri two trips around the globe in total distance. And that's about 10,000 bees. It takes about uh, one bee is going to collect about one tenth of a teaspoon in her entire lifetime, which is about six weeks. Well, and I know you feel as I do, and I've become much more passionate just being here and doing bees about what's going on with the honeybees. 40%, mm -hmm. I believe, is the number lost just last we're really year. really looking, we're, I am definitely not looking forward to seeing the numbers for this year. 2015 was worse. 2014 was 40%. Yeah. Um, we had a short span where we actually had a, uh, a decrease for a little while and then went right back up. Um, you know, as beekeepers, we consider anything about 25% a sustainable loss rate. Um, we have actually been losing bees at a steady rate since about World War II. Coincidentally, also happens to be the advent of the major usage of pesticides and insecticides and herbicides. Um, that's not to say that it's all directly related to that, but there's a lot of things that have changed. Um, my mentor will tell you in the 30 years he's been doing beekeeping, about 20 years ago, he used to bank, take it right to the bank. Each hive, give him 100 pounds of honey. He would still leave honey for the bees. He could take 100 pounds. He, we now hope to get 60 pounds of honey out of you know, a hive, let alone at least maybe half your hives. It's a very big difference. Um, and, you know, so what we're looking at right now is it's not necessarily just herbicides and pesticides. It's not necessarily just varroa mites and the other different, you know, pests that are taking care. It's not just illnesses. It's not the lack of flowers. It is this whole environmental storm that is really, it's a, it's a, a perfect storm that is taking over the bees, and but that can is what's playing. We live without them. bees. We need bees. That's I mean, we could flowers. live with them, but we're going to be living on grits right. and uh, flour. It's going to change the entire you know, food chain. Absolutely. Uh, you know, so one of the one of the statistics they throw out is about a third of the food you put in your mouth comes from bees. Raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, almonds, walnuts, citrus, broccoli. You know, I could make the list go on and on. Here at the Golden Door your healthy diet is very, very dependent on bees. Yeah. And it's not one third, it's probably more than half, uh, the, especially the vegetables. You well, know. People really care about this. Like in New York City, they're building beehives on top of skyscrapers. There's been a and lot these of beehives them, yeah. have to travel far across the, the, the two rivers to find food. But even so, that doesn't make a dent in what's needed to bring back bees. You know what, I, you know, um, one of the best quotes that I ever heard, it's not mine, uh, and I wish I could remember the gentleman's name right now, but it was basically, it was, it was out of, taken out of a movie, and I just, it resonates so well, is that, you know, the, the future of beekeeping is not one excellent beekeeper with 50,000 thriving hives. Mm -hmm. The future of beekeeping is 50,000 people, each with a thriving hive. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if you remember this, about, you know, um, early spring of this year, early January, all of a sudden there's this sensation on the market called the flow hive. And everybody was all a buzz, sorry for the pun, uh, all a buzz about this flow hive. And what it was is this ingenious um, invention of where they took a regular hive. And when you have a chance, you go up to the back and you look at the hive and you look at the, the frames and you can see how they build their combs and the hexagonal cells are vertical, but a little bit of an angle upwards. And what the hive does, they turn a little crank, and the crank splits the hive, and the honey runs through the middle and out of spigot and into your jar. Oh, wonderfully, you have your own fresh raw honey. I mean, what a great thing to have everyone have some purpose, like a birdhouse to have in your backyard. And you don't have to have a big hive, you can have a small hive. And if you have property, even the more reason to have a hive. And one of the best things that the bees do for us here is not the honey. 
Now honey is one of those great byproducts of an animal like the honeybee, but it is by far the least out of their main job. Their job is that pollination. And I will tell you, when we didn't have the bees, I remember how, our, uh, how much of a production we would have from that garden. We had the bees, yeah, wow, it's incredible, we right? had it a much larger yeah, harvest. A colony of bee consists of 20,000 to 60,000 honeybees and one queen. Worker bees are female and live for six weeks and do all the work. How much honey do you feel you're going to be able to get from a hive? At least one of our hives. Um, I will feel incredibly lucky if I get 20 pounds of honey out of our hives. Is that in a, in, give me the time span, is that annually? I would say annually. I mean, 20 pounds out of each hive, I would really feel, um, I would feel that like they did their job. The hard thing for us here in our area is that we are in a dry, arid area. We are you know, primarily a desert landscape. Um, we do have trees and we have some hillsides that are really you know, good. Um, you know, the garden is great, but like I said, you know, that, the gargantuan amount of flowers that it takes to make that, pound, that honey, exactly. you know, the amount of honey it takes for one hive, who's gonna do that better, us or Mother Nature? And the, the real one that we should be supporting is Mother Nature because she is much better at making a diverse array of many different flowers, many different seasons throughout the year. You know, you and I, we're, we're, we're terrible at it compared to Mother Nature. You know, uh, there are people with green thumbs and then, there are mother, and then there's Mother Nature. Do you think it's one of the most misunderstood workers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean I, well, people before, look at them and just can't wait to like get rid of them. It's, I hate bees. I hate bees. Sure. I mean, well, it's it's the the fear. Yeah, yeah. And the fear is is but a natural not thing. They're interested in humans. Yeah, you know, they are. They really aren't. No. You know, when one of the one of the times most people get stung uh, around the pool, they accidentally yeah. step on them, or they're either you know swimming and they land on it. The bee didn't want to be in the pool. You know, it, those are new bees that didn't get the memo that the pond is much better to go to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and there, be, so what does a what does a person do who's slightly afraid of a bee not try to overreact? Just, what would you recommend? Just keep, just move on. Just keep moving. Just, and they you know, uh, you, they have no interest in you if you have no interest right. in them. Uh, and I will, I will, I will tell you if you if you really want a chance to observe observe a bee and what they're doing. You go out to that garden, you see a bee sitting on a flower, you could sit there and watch them for That's hours, true. and they would not the way, care that true. you were there. That's so true. I, I will pet the you bees out there on trees. The and apple, main, tell and me the apple vine that's across oh, the, the parking lot. red line. apple succulents. But they're like millions. You can't even see them all. Uh, so uh, what I always like but to share is that, you know, after, after something like this, when we talk and we discuss about this, then all of a sudden it's on your consciousness. And I promise you, especially when it gets out in the springtime, you're going to find bees on things that you had no idea. And they've always been there. And they've been going there. We just don't realize it. You don't see mm -hmm. it. They're so good at going in, getting their job done, and getting out. They are incredible workers. And like I said, they do everything for that hive. You are not, unless you are in the, you're obstructing the success of that hive, they don't want to have anything to do with oh, you. No. And, you know, they, they, they do understand that they will die if they sting. They, they do know that. I mean, um, that is a last resort. But again, some are more apt to uh, be aggressive and some are not. I do mean, all bees die or do they have to lose or Is that the point? Is that when they yeah. sting, that's it, it's over? Uh, you know, they may. So a bee's uh, stinger has a barb on the end, and um, except for the queen. And the she doesn't have a stinger. She doesn't. Have, she has a stinger, but she doesn't have a barb. Doesn't have a barb. Because uh, I'll, I'll explain that one yeah, yeah, yeah. quickly. But so th when the bee stings you, the barb sticks you. And a tough, leathery skinned animal like us, that barb yeah, stays. stays in there. Yeah. And then when the bee flies away, it essentially eviscerates herself and leaves the venom sac and the pump alone uh, back. And that's why they always say to take the stinger out immediately. Don't squeeze it. Don't try to pinch it out with twin tweezers. Take your thumbnail and just scrape it off and break it. It's fine, your antibodies will take away, you know. But the, that venom sac can actually continue to pump venom into your system for 20 minutes. So that's where a lot, you know, some people will get stung and it, you know, it really swells up, everybody swells up. I mean, if you don't swell up, you, well, that bee really didn't get a lot of venom in you. And you know, it's interesting to note that the venom is very, very similar, almost the same to rattlesnake poison, just wow. a very different size or a different amount. And what about the queen? So the queen, she reserves this just for stinging other queens. I tell you, I mean, I. <laughs> so. All righty. What when she, you how have, does the other queen get in there? Get the uh, warriors on well, the floor. Well, if another if another hive 
comes into uh, you know there are there are cases where a hive you know a, a another um, swarm of bees will come and try to take over a hive if they are more aggressive they feel that they are they could push out the other bees but that's really a very very rare case the number one case for this is that when you know when a hive is successful in other words when the the queen and this usually happens around spring um, she did her job very well she laid a lot of eggs, she's got a lot of bees, and they've taken up more space than they actually have. And so what the queen then does is, the, or actually the workers sense the same thing, and they will start to build queen cells. And these are different than the hexagonal cells that you're used to seeing. These are cells that protrude and hang out from the hive, and usually maybe closer to the bottom of the frame. And these vertical cells, the queen will then go and lay fertilized eggs in each one of these. And these will, come, these will become queens. And the workers then don't feed the regular regurgitated mash mix that they give all the rest of the worker be, workers and males. They actually secrete a whole different food. It's called royal jelly. And this is a super power packed food. That is the actual food that powers the um, development of the reproductive organs in the queen. Every other female has reproductive organs. They're all undeveloped. And without having this food, they would not develop. So they give this queen royal jelly. They may do it like six, seven, eight, and they won't bank it all on just one. They will make a bunch. Now, first queen to emerge, her first job is to seek out the other cells and kill the queens before they emerge. There can only be one. And if the other, if she gets out and there's another queen already out, well, that's hand-to-hand -hand combat out there on the comb. So that's why she can sting multiple times, because she has to sting other queens in order to make sure that she is the one that survives. So oh the stronger wins, right? So, you know, it's like incredible, right? You've never heard of these, right? It's just such a, they're just ancient creatures that are just unbelievable. Uh, you know, so do bees recognize their hives individually? Like yeah. We have a whole row of them. A, a, a question I often get is like, how, how how close can I, the, the hives be together? Well, you know, migratory beekeepers, we put the hives right next to each other. Um, and then there is a problem sometimes what we call drift. And that's when you see the bees and they, they come to the front, they kind of they kind of like do this. They look really clumsy. Um, and you would be too if you're way nothing and you're trying, you know, the air, wind's blowing you around and you don't really see the gap on the, you know it's here. It's, I know this is right here. This is, so the, the amazing thing is how they, you know, they can give each other pinpoint directions on getting to the food. So we say that they can travel up six miles. Most of them travel underneath three miles. But how they actually tell each other where the food is at is really uh, is quite amazing. But even how they find a swarm, how they swarm and find a new home is even more amazing. But so to find another food, there's a bee that goes out. She's a forager. She may be the scout. First one happens upon a pouch of sunflowers. And these sunflowers are about a mile away from the hive. So when she comes back to the hive, full of food, full of pollen, she's all excited. She wants to tell the rest of the hive, I found it. This is the spot. Mother load. Bingo. So if you look at the frame, and the frame is vertical, straight up and down is access is in relation to the sun. Now when the bees leave the hive, they always leave and head out southeast. So when she first, she will be standing there, and she does this, what we call the waggle dance. And she shakes her abdomen really, really very hard. The harder it is the better the food source is. And then she will walk. And how far she walks is how, f you know, how far it is to the next turn. Every second is a sixth of a mile. So they she know walk. all this math? They, well, I mean, I don't think they do it's the math so necessarily. This is just like, in, it, this is just innate. So when they leave, the bee will do a turn. She'll, she'll turn about 45 degrees, right? And that means you go out and you turn 45 Seven degrees feet. to the sun. GPS and then you travel it's and amazing. she walks for two seconds that means you go two sixths of a mile from here and then they use like uh, land markers so like whether another big tree or something like that okay then you get to this spot and then she <laughs> turns like 120 degrees okay well I turn this way to the Sun 120 degrees and then she walks like three seconds so you go three sixths of a mile this way so you got half a mile that so way. all these bees are watching her so directions. they're all actually following her and mimicking exactly the dance. Other bees that have got the dance, they're going around to the front and smelling her to smell where those, what type of flower it was, the patch. And then they got it, they leave. And then they fly about 30 feet over 
the tree line and they you know, get to the point and then they come down and they find the smell that is exactly, and their smell is incredibly incredible. Acu uh, very, very accurate, very accurate. So there's that famous saying, you know, busy as a bee. Yeah. Do these darn bees ever sleep? They, they don't necessarily sleep. What do no. they do at night? You know what's amazing? The it's like actually gone, before I came in here, um, I was up in the hives and I was going and collecting some of the stuff to bring out here. And what I love to do in the evening is I love to go and I put my ear right up against the hive. And you just hear the activity that's it's going warm. on inside. Even at well, night. Well, the hive is warm too. They keep that hive throughout the year, whether it's freezing or it's 110 degrees, they keep that hive year round within a few degrees, like three, How does that three to four. Like it's 100 degrees uh, like outside. Like it's 100 or it's degrees, 50. they use swamp cooling, just like what we use out in our in our uh, 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 you know our, uh, greenhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they there's bees that come out yeah. here, collect water from the yeah. from the fountain. They go back, they take the water and they put it on the sides, up on the top roofs of the sides of the uh, of the walls, and the water comes down and it cools down the hive. Now there's other bees that are inside the hive that are positioned and their job is just to fan and make sure the air circulates. And there's other bees, especially on hot days, that sit out on that front sill outside the hive and their job is just to fan air out. What about the winter when it's 50? And then at, during the winter time, they, I put on what's called a reducer, so I just reduce down the hole, just a very small little gap. Um, and the, then at that point, they kind of cluster, like, I mean, most of us have seen like how penguins keep each other warm. And that's very similar. Um, the bees on the outside, they are eating honey. Um, and the bees on the interior, you know, that characteristic, bzzz, right? We were talking about their wings. Well, that, that is, they can actually just uh, activate their flight muscles. And the flight muscles can raise the body temperature of the bee. Um, they can, and that's how they regulate the temperature. So the bees in the center are creating some warmth and the bees on the outside are grabbing some food, and then once they've gotten their fill of food, they go back in. The bees that are now need more food, they rotate outwards, and that's how they keep that center where they're incubating the brood because they're gonna still need to have bees coming out, and they need to keep it a nice balmy 90 degrees or so. Wow, I just have a couple more questions. Yeah. I, you've now started, which I think is brilliant, a bee tour. Yes. So when you do this bee tour, what's the most surprising thing that the guests that you feel the guests learn? I think the most surprising thing is like what we were talking about with fear, you know, actually getting over the idea that you have to, um, you know, you see a bee and you gotta head the other direction. You know, I, I, you know, I take the tour right up to the hive. Yeah, there you um, do. And I also have positioned my good hives on the end. So <laughs> my, my testy girls are on the far <laughs> other end. Um, but however, you know, I think that is probably the, the most surprising and the most rewarding thing is the is actually not during the tour. It's the following subsequent days where um, where folks will come up and, and say, "Oh my God, I was watching the bee out here, or I saved a bee from the pool." Or, that's the most rewarding part. It, it's fun. not it's not necessarily someone really latching on to all the facts and the figures and what happens. It's just the fact that we're able to cross that gap of fear and make it something that people recognize now the importance, and it's not necessarily something to be afraid of, but something to cherish. So if you, every time we have our speaker series, we close with this one very special question, and so I'm going to, of course, ask you, if you could give our guests the perfect golden nugget that they could take home about bees, what would it be? I'd say the, the biggest thing I always love to share, and this is the same thing I share at the end of my tour, is um, each of us, are not necessarily going to become beekeepers, and I know that. Um, we could all go out and plant some more plants, and that's, that's very helpful. The most important thing I think that we can do, though, as individuals, is recognize our responsibility in that what we choose every day has a direct effect on everything else. And that be, if you choose to spray insecticides and, and pesticides around your house, make sure that you're not spraying those on you know, your, your plants that are feeding pollinators. Mm -hmm. Make sure that, you know, just keep it to your house. Keep it on the inside of the house. You're not, gonna have, you're not feeding pollinators on the inside of your house, you know. Um, make sure that what you're choosing, the food that you're choosing is not coming from something that's been doused with herbicides. We've been fortunate enough now in the United States and, and much of the world to reduce the amount of pesticides we're using. But we've greatly increased the usage of herbicides, and yeah. the herbicides are big carcinogens, and they also have detrimental effects on, 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 on wildlife. So, well, I want to thank you, Greg. Thank you. Because I know no, this is a passionate this is, this is conversation for you. And I hope we 
delivered what we promised we would, that you learned something about bees tonight yes. that you may not have known. And I want to thank Greg again, because we love thank you. to talk about it. And thank you for sharing this night with us.